Um, this is a, an agenda of the program today. We'll go with the introductions of the networks, then we'll do a couple of housekeeping uh, um, uh, uh, housekeeping um, items. And then um, our, our moderator, Daniel Garza, will introduce the speakers for today. You guys are going to enjoy the webinar because we have great speakers. Next slide. So just to let you know, we're going to have the microphones mute so that way we won't have any interference uh, with, the, with the program. And the meeting will be recorded and will be posted, uh, the meeting on the, on the partner website, the Nuestras Voces, and also the colleagues from the National LGBT Cancer Network. Uh, during the presentations, feel free to send your questions and you can use the, um, you can put them on the, uh, via the chat. And at the end of the presentations, we'll be um, uh, uh, asking the questions to the presenters. Uh, also, feel free to put any comments during the presentation as well. And then at the end, we're going to be asking you if you can please uh, um, complete a post-webinar survey uh, just to get your feedback and, and, and to let us know how the program was today. And I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll be happy to um, provide any, any, any answers to your questions. And then again, um, you will enjoy our presenters today. Next slide. So the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, we're a nonprofit public health organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., and our mission is Best Health for All. Um, the core value of our work is the work that we do with community-based organizations. We are the largest in all the Hispanic network of community organizations that deliver services to more than 15 million people around the country. We also do not take money from uh, funds from either tobacco, alcohol, or sugar sweetening beverage companies. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, I'm the program director for the Nuestras Voces Network program. This is a CDC funded program that is working to um, address commercial tobacco use and reduce um, tobacco related cancer disparities, in particular among Hispanic communities. This is the focus of our, our work. We work to um, enhance um, uh, collaborations and partnerships and provide technical assistance to the state programs, conduct uh, mass media campaigns. And this is all with the aim of uh, um, educating our community and providing trusted information to our community about um, commercial tobacco use prevention and cancer prevention and control. Uh, we also are um, working with six community partners at the local level that help us amplify the work that we do uh, with the initiative. In our, our partners are based in California, in Georgia, in Illinois, New York, and Texas. Um, and another thing that we do as part of the program, um, since our organization is a public health organization, we also leverage um, some of the other initiatives that they, 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 the organization is implementing. So that way we can um, link our community with trusted sources of information and also through community services and clinical services that includes um, cancer screening and prevention services, as well as um, tobacco cessation services. Next slide, please. And now I'm, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, um, uh, Noel, uh, from, from the National LGBT Cancer Network. Noel? Hello. Thank you so much, Marcella. My name is Noel Larkin. I use he, him pronouns. I'm based in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a project manager for the National LGBT Cancer Network. Um, like Marcella, um, I, we're one of the national eight networks focused on health equity. Obviously, we focused on LGBTQ communities. Um, the National LGBT Cancer Network um, is a national nonprofit. Um, we have over 500 um, members that we work with, and ultimately, our goal is um, kind of three areas, education, advocacy, and training. Um, we provide education to queer communities about cancer risk, the importance of screenings, um, and tobacco cessation. We also do a lot of advocacy work um, and engagement in mainstream cancer organizations, media, and research. And a big part of our advocacy work, again, is to make sure that we're collecting data on LGBTQ communities and asking those sexual orientation and gender identity questions any place we collect demographics. And finally, the thing we probably do the most is training um, training public health, healthcare providers, providing TA to state and local health departments, pretty much anyone that wants to improve their engagement and capacity to work with LGBTQ communities, we wanna support that. Uh, so the next slide. A little bit about what we do. So our program, we offer customized training, technical assistance, um, resource guides, toolkits, and also um, tailored media. So we'll 
create a bunch of Facebook posts, social media posts um, that your organization, if you're a member of ours, can put your logo on and share. Um, so we really work on stating some best practices and guiding the work that folks are doing um, nationally around tobacco and cancer for LGBTQ communities. Um, so I think we might drop some links in the chat um, to our, our website, our resource library, and also if you're from an organization and you're interested in membership, how to join our network. Um, but that's enough about us. I'm going to turn it over to actual um, Daniel Garza, who's our moderator. Um, Daniel, I'm sure will say more about himself, but he's a, um, an educator, a public speaker, a writer, a comedian, an author, um, and a survivor. Um, so I'm super happy to welcome Daniel as our moderator. Oh, thank you. No, that's a great introduction. I hope I live up to that one. How's everybody doing? Welcome. It is uh, March 22nd, 2023, and we welcome you to our uh, presentation. I hope you guys get as much information out of it as I have in my notes. I want to start by uh, welcoming all of you, reminding you that this is an interactive conversation. So please post your questions in the comment section, in the chat, and we'll make sure. We want to thank Bryce ahead of time for keeping up with all of those. Uh, a couple of little things more about me. Yes, I am an anal cancer survivor, and that's how I got uh, connected with the National LGBT Cancer Network and with Nuestra Voices. And here's a little bit of to start the conversation. Colorectal cancer represents the third leading cause of death from cancer in the United States. The American Cancer Society estimates that 106,970 people, I'm gonna say that again, 106,970 people in the U.S. will be told for the first time that they have colorectal cancer this year. The ACS also estimates that 52,550 lives will be lost in 2023 due to colorectal cancer. And that is why this conversation today is so important. So I'm gonna start by introducing one of our doctors. Um, Dr. Leopoldo Fernandez is a surgical oncologist at Virginia Commonwealth University, Macy Center Cancer Center, and assistant professor in the Division of Surgical Oncology at VCU School of Medicine. So I wanna let him say more about himself. Dr. Uh, Fernandez, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. It's so good to see you. Very good to see you too. Um, trying to share the screen so I can put my slides off. Yeah. I have worked with Dr. Fernandez before and I'm always amazed at all the information that he brings to our session. So I'm excited to see what he's gonna to present to us today. While he brings up his screens, um, I'll give you some more information. Colorectal cancer screenings can prevent cancer to the tension and removal of precancerous growths and can detect the disease at an early stage when treatment is more successful. And it is, a, it is suggested that we get tested or get screened by age 45 and, and on. There we go. There's. Can you see my presentation or just the. Yes, yes we can. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to both the Nuestra Voces Network and the National LGBT Cancer Network. It yeah. is really a privilege to be here. Um, colon cancer is a big problem in the population and um, especially our population. We want to make sure we get the best and, and not be left behind on, on things that are very easy to do to make a big difference in our well-being. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about colon cancer in this, in the from the point of view of screening, and um, and specific for our population. So for both Hispanics and LGBTQ plus population. So as uh, Daniel was saying, the third most common diagnosed cancer in males, second in females, third leading cause of death, and this is in the U.S. But same problem across the world. The, the 106,000 people, it's actually colon cancer, the rectal cancer is 50,000 instances, north of 150,000 cases. Some numbers say actually 180,000 patients diagnosed per year in the US and about over 50,000 people do die. So it is a big problem for the population. There's about a 4% risk of colon cancer or colorectal cancer um, throughout the life of an individual. Um, so why why do we bring screening to the table? The, the natural history it 
for most colorectal cancers, they actually come from a polyp. And uh, we divide polyps in small and large, uh, usually around the eight millimeter mark. And the screening has the benefit that um, we actually shown that screening over the last decades has decreased how much cancer is diagnosed and how much people die. And, um, and this is thought to be mostly related to screening. There's multiple types of screening, and I'll get into that in a, a, in a couple of minutes. But the take on point is that no matter what you do for screening, they all work as well, as long as you do it. So the most important take home point, I'm gonna start on my second slide is, no matter what the screening you do, just do something and do it as recommended. Um, everything is, has a cause, a harm. So screening harm is mainly related to the risk of a colonoscopy. And the main risk of a colonoscopy is having a bowel perforation. For all comers having a colonoscopy, the risk of a perforation is about 0.08%. Now, the thing about testing that don't include a colonoscopy, that comes with a caveat that if you test positive, then you will need a colonoscopy. So in these studies, even though the whole population is 0 0.08, actually 0 0.3, 0 0.03 of those who were perforated actually started by having a positive test that was a stool test. So the other thing is, is cost effective? Does it, it and, and in terms of how much it costs to save lives and how much the test costs, but it obviously changes depending on the test. A colonoscopy is about $1,000. The, oh, the stool samples, they're much cheaper, so they're very widely, but in general, it's somewhere between $15,000 and $50,000 that it costs to save uh, per life you're saved. And that, it's, uh, it's actually fairly low in, in terms of everything we do to take care of patients. So just as a reference, like um, countries who have socialized medicine, like their cutoffs are like seventy, dollars $100,000. So this is well below uh, what is cost effective. Now, the this is a kind of busy slide. It's um, different tests have different sensitivities. The purple one is the big money one. This is cancer. And then the, the orange, blue, and green are how sensitive that specific test to a polyp depending on the size, so five, 10, or six to nine millimeters. And the colonoscopy is the best across the board, of course, is the most invasive. And But you can see that every single test has a very good sensitivity for colorectal cancer. The fecal test, they have a lower sensitivity for polyps. So that's why you have to um, have it done every, every year or every three years, depending on which one it is. Um, recently, the guidelines were upgraded in 2021. This is the uh, screening guidelines by the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. And the big difference now, screening is recommended for any adult above 45 years old. And this is for average risk individuals, so anybody walking on the street. This does not include high-risk individuals. Those get special guidelines, which I'm not going to get into today. But pretty much the summary is 45. Any adults over 45 should get screened. If you hit 76 over that, then you, you're supposed to have a discussion, but the discussion is pretty much if we think you have a life expectancy of 10 years or more, then you should get screened regardless. This is the guidelines, and I'm just showing this just to show that just to speak about the guidelines, we can have a three-hour discussion just about which they are and options and downsides and upsides. But back to the beginning, my first point, take home point, just do something and follow the guidelines. So if you're doing a specific test, you, ne you need to do it as often as it's recommended, otherwise it doesn't work. And this is a summary of all the two previous slides. If you're over 45, get screen, and you can pretty much do anything. So now what happens to uh, Latinos as compared to non-whites? There's a lot of data that Latinos, Latinx, um, whichever the paper writes them as, there's always decrease in how much they're screened. So this one specifically looked at colorectal cancer and they found something very weird that, so even though sometimes these Latinos in this population they study, they actually had a higher odds of getting colorectal cancer screening. Most of them did get a stool-based screening, but overall they actually ended up having a lower chance of being referred for an endoscopy. So even when they had a positive stool, they had done the first step of screening and they were not referred to a endoscopy after they tested positive. 
So not only less likely to go colorectal screening in this specific study, even when they test for stool, then there's always bumps in the road, so to speak. Um, this is our studies, and uh, you look at multiple study or review, uh, and this is for not specific, but any preventive measure. So it's a problem across the board. Uh, we do continue to experience lower, lower preventive care utilization. Um, and uh, what they see is actually, if you look at different interventions, the most cost-effective preventive measures were the actual, where the disparities were worst. So smoking cessation, colorectal cancer, influenza, for example. Um, how about our LGBTQ plus uh, community? Um, this is a study, I think, from Oregon, um, bigger part from Canada. The, um, they, they look at how LGBTQs compared to uh, the rest of the population. What they found is lesbian, bisexual women were less likely to come and have cervical cancer screening, as well as mammography. Uh, on the other side, gay and bisexual men were actually more likely to come and have anal and colorectal cancer screening. Transgender individuals were on the negative across the board. They did have a lower rates of screening than cisgender individuals for any type of cancer. Uh, they also look at the barriers, and the barriers were across the board. They, there were some barriers for the individual, for the healthcare providers, as well as the hospital administration level. And when they look at what helps, and they found that the most effective thing is good communication um, with uh, between the patient and the healthcare provider mostly, but of course, community and, and healthcare system and pretty much communication across the board helps. So what is colorectal cancer? Um, pretty much a, col a cancer of the entire colon or the rectum. And... Um, Usually when patients do come for screening or they don't do screening, so they have a symptom, they'll have a colonoscopy that usually diagnoses the colon cancer with a biopsy. Then we get staging. So we get CT scans, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And uh, CA is a tumor marker, which uh, usually helps for follow-up, but it does help in the beginning. Uh, and they often meet a, a surgeon and depending on the stage and the situation, we start working on treatment and um, staging is a big topic also, and we pretty much look at the tumor and the tumor, we look at whether it's, the tumor is confined to a lining. So this actually, is, uh, it's mislabeled, it's not stage, it's T or tumor zero. Uh, T1 is through the mucosa, T2 through the mus into the muscle, T3 through the muscle, and T4 through the lining of the outside of the bowel. Lymph nodes is simply put whether you have lymph nodes or not, and then we count them and how many, and that complicates it for us. And whether patients have metastasis or not, and metastasis can be different kinds. And uh, you can see here how a tumor can essentially spread the cells, cancer cells can go into a lymphatic vessel and go that way to a lymph node, or go into a blood vessel and that way goes to a bloodstream and to a different organ, like the liver, for example. Or when they get to the surface, actually cells can shed off the bowel and around the belly and stick. And that's what causes what we call peritoneal carcinomatosis, which is this picture on the right. And this here on the left, this is a liver metastasis. Um, then we put the T staging or the tumor, the nodes and the metastasis, and we group them. And it's essentially four big groups. So stage one, um, it's one this early tumor, no nodes, no metastasis. T2 is bigger tumor, still no nothing in the lymph nodes or away. If you have positive lymph nodes, that's stage three. If you have any metastasis, regardless of lymph nodes or anything else, that's stage four. Um, the stage four, the, it is different whether you have only one metastasis or two different sites, or the worst one is usually carcinomatosis. And that matters for survival. This just our survival curve. So this is everybody diagnosed. And as time goes by, how many people are still alive? The top, the better, obviously the stage. And you can see from being over 70% of people uh, still alive on stage one, you can trickles down to 30 on stage three. And stage four is well below 10%. So how we diagnose cancer and the staging matters, not only because how you live, because how we treat it. 
Uh, stage one, usually we just resect it. Uh, the very early ones, we can even get away with a endoscopic resection. Those are very selected, but usually people get surgery. Uh, and that involves the part of the colon and the lymph nodes, both for stage one and two. Only, only few people in stage two do get chemo radiation. When you have lymph node involvement, then your chemo comes up. When it's locally advanced, like tumor invades other organs or it goes somewhere else, that's when it gets complicated and we kind of case by, by base. And, um, and, and the mainstay of treatment in those cases, usually chemotherapy. Then we look at other things like how many metastases, uh, is it just a small amount? or is it widespread? And then if it's oligometastatic, is it resectable versus non-resectable? Um, so does screening matter over uh, and how? And this is a study from Mass General Hospital and what they look at their experience, and this is over 1200 people diagnosed with colorectal cancer and they compare patients who had their cancer diagnosed on screening versus coming with a symptom that led to the diagnosis. And what they found is that the tumor was more invasive, so more likely to have a T3 tumor, more likely to have a node involvement cancer, more likely to have metastasis, more likely to be at risk of death on follow-up, more likely to have the cancer recurrence. So survivals and, and both disease-free intervals were uh, worse. Um, so this is screen people versus non-screen people. You see a huge gap in the curves survival over a year, 80%. This is hitting 50% for people who came with symptoms, which is kind of obvious if you say that people who come with symptoms are more advanced, they're going to have worse survival of that. But what I found surprised, so they, and this is exactly what they show in their data. People with symptoms came with more advanced cancer. And I think that's what everybody expected. What I know, I think maybe surprising is that when they match people by stage, all the people, and the, and this is comparing two more, and, and I know it's a busy slide, but if you look at the light gray lines are people who came with screen, and the black lines are people who came with symptoms, and you can see how people on screening um, have a better survival. So this uh, on the top is uh, matching for T stage, on the middle is matching for nodal stage, and the bottom is matching for metastasis or no metastasis. So even people who had metastasis, had better survival if they were found on screening ultra, um, versus when they were found with a symptom. And this is um, sort of same same thing said in different way. They, they looked at uh, multivariate analysis. So what they did is a statistic way to see how much is actually the effect of screening. And they, they corrected for all those things I just said, T stage and stage metastas metastasis, as well as age of the patient, which they notice that people getting screened were younger in general, but even when matched for all those things, the outcomes were much different and much better for people who got diagnosed with screening. So it does matter for staging. It does matter for the treatment you receive. It does matter for how long you live, as well as something that we haven't touched on, but people who get more aggressive cancer, we end up having to do bigger surgeries and um, and the, the outcome and the function they do have, it tends to be uh, impacted by those uh, very often. Um, how am I doing on time, Daniel? Um, you want to talk a little bit about prevention metastatic disease? We have about four more minutes on your time. All right. So metastatic disease is something I, I deal with as part of my practice. So this is what you don't want to have. We still have um treatments that are uh with curative intent and um and i'm, I'm just going to mention one that i um have experience with this is back to the beginning or the middle peritoneal carcinomatosis spread of cancer and um as you remember i mentioned that when the tumors grow through the wall they shed cells and they spread around the belly so uh, those cells you can imagine stick into the lining of the belly sucking nutrients and then growing and forming little nodules that become bigger and then eventually tumors. Um, how about this? this? This is a little bit of historical, but this was the first study on it that they just put patients on the study to see how long they live for. There was no good treatment. This is before modern chemotherapies and people took about median survival of six months. So uh, from diagnosis to ha half and half being dead is six months. 
Um, then people started looking at uh, treatment, uh, a surgical treatment of this, which includes uh, removing all the cancer and then doing chemotherapy. Started with the surgeon high, and I'll briefly mention it. And then people started changing the mean of survival, increasing it uh, significantly. And as experience grew, um, the the patient selection got better. The chemotherapies actually evolved, and we got better chemotherapies. And now we're seeing um, better survivals. Um, what is this surgery, it has two parts. They started with the surgery, we cut all the tumors out. And then after we're done with that, we put chemotherapy in the abdomen while the patient's still in the OR. Um, just for a warning, a couple of graphic pictures coming. So anybody who doesn't want, just close your eyes. Um, so this is one patient, uh, left is morning and right is the evening after, sur after resection. Uh, same patient, same day. So it's a bit of a dramatic patient, but illustrates, and, and this is the same patient from the inside, this old tumor, and this is the same patient without any tumor. And you can see how we take the lining off the liver. This is what the liver was still with the lining is. This is all the tumor removed, including the lining of the liver. And this is a muscle, same, the lining, the peritoneum that I show you on the other picture. Um, I think the graphic things are over for those who want to open their eyes again. Uh, then once we're done removing the, the tumors, then we put these tubes in, in the belly. Uh, the way we do it, we close it watertight, and then we connect to a perfusion machine. There are different runs available, and this is schematic. So the, this fluid with chemotherapy goes in and out of the perfusion machine, so it distributes the chemotherapy throughout the abdomen. And with this technique, together with uh, modern chemotherapies, um, we've changed that median survival from six months back in 1989 in that Oregon uh, study to the latest study in 2018 published in France. Now we're seeing five-year survival, uh, median survivals of, of 40 months. So still big difference, but um, still big uh, room for improvement. This is our experience here in BCU, and this correlates with experiences throughout the world with a bigger series. And you can see the biggest part of the pie is colon cancer, appendix is essentially part of the cone and um and that's all i had to say so i'm looking forward to your questions and thank you for your invitation again thank you dr fernandez for those of you uh listening i always learn something new from dr fernandez which is really great and uh i believe you need your own reality show with all these pictures and graphs and, and stuff <laughs> so we're going to be working on that one for those of you watching uh and listening what stuck out to you? What was the biggest uh, information that you found out today? Uh, we're talking about rachel and um, pardon me, uh, colorectal cancer screenings. Uh, talking about uh, barriers when it comes to the LGBT community and the, the Latinx community, Hispanic community. So let us know if you have some more questions, and we'll be back with Dr. Fernandez in the Q and A portion. So get those questions ready. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jose Trevino. Chair of the Division of Surgical Oncology at the BCU School of Medicine and Surgeon in Chief at BCU Massey Cancer Center. He also holds the Walter Lawrence Jr. Distinguished Professor of Oncology at Massey and is an Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery at BCU College of Medicine. Dr. Jose Trevino, I don't know how you made time to be with us today, but we appreciate you being here. Uh, please give us your presentation. What do you got for us? Sure, sure. So, you know, I, I just have a, I'm not going to spend too much time in the presentation, um, but I, you know, I'd like to just acknowledge Dr. Fernandez and, and what he does. And so, uh, you know, first and foremost, obviously screening is incredibly important for everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, gender, or identity. And the reason that it's so important is because if we don't consider screening as, 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 as a tool, we don't catch these cancers early. And if we don't catch these cancers early, um, people people die. I mean, let's just be frank. Um, the earlier, the better. I mean, there's there's old sayings about that a million times over. But for the most part, we have to really understand um, uh, that that the earlier we get screened, the better we're all going to be at the end of the day. Um, so the, the talk that or the real brief kind of discussion that I'm going to bring in here next is primarily going to be around the idea of diversity and the importance of our diverse um, culture and elder, elder, our diverse kind of being in general and, and why that's that really helps um, in, in, in how we, we look at cancer. And so can anybody, can everybody see this? I didn't hear yes, it Yes, we can, we can see it. Thank right, you. Perfect. So let's listen, this is something that's actually novel. This is something that's new. Um, and 
And I love this slide. And this is probably the most important slide for me is because, you know, as we start to identify ourselves further and further and further um, in, in this country on so many levels, we sometimes forget that we all come from a different place and our identity as well as our as race and ethnicity, that's all, those are very important factors that can determine our overall outcomes. And so this slide I love because this is where we came from, right? I mean, we didn't, a lot of, of us are indigenous. We're, we're part of this, this North American continent. Um, our ancestors were here, but our ancestors came from somewhere. And so when I talk to Latinos, especially, it, it sometimes I throw a curveball at them because I'll tell them that a Latino from San Diego will not have the same ancestry as a Latino from Miami. And it makes sense because a Latino from San Francisco or, or San Diego will have a lot more American Indian along with some, some indigenous and, you know, and with the indigenous components as well as with American and a, and, a, and a mix. And the Caribbean will have some Afro-American or African roots as well. And so do these things matter? And the answer is absolutely, they, it does. Um, and so we demonstrated this before and many times before, especially when we're looking at pancreatic cancer, that certain patients with cancer, and this is true also with, with colorectal and more and more coming, is that certain patients do better than others. Blacks do worse, uh, whites do somewhere in the middle, and actually Latinos do better. And so there's a survival advantage in cancer, and, and this kind of demonstrates itself here as well. And further breaking down Latinos and Hispanics into parts of the, of the, of the world or that this hemisphere that are different, like you're from South America or Dominican, Caribbean, what have you. And this also makes a difference as well. And what we're trying to do here is just pretty much just demonstrate the importance of diversity and the identification of it. And so how about the inclusion? Do we have a problem with that? And is, again, is this an important topic? And the answer is yes. And I'm, I'm going to reinforce this a million times over. Our country is going to change. And here we have like Asian, Latino, Black, white. And as by the year 2060, we're going to be a really half and half with the white population in this country. And if you believe what I just said, that certain races and ethnicities do better than others, that, that, that should be a factor that we identify and allow people to understand, especially when you're getting treatment because there are certain clues that we might have that others don't and that we can help everyone with cancer. And so is it important for us to be a part of the structure of, of, of the therapeutics and medicine and how we test certain drugs? The answer is yes. Is there importance again of identity? The answer is absolutely yes. And it wasn't until 2017 that this country, this government decided to say, hey, maybe we should start including race and ethnicity. Now notice I've stuck on race and ethnicity and I haven't gone further into identity, which is a completely different topic that needs to be addressed. And so this, we're just at the tip of the iceberg with this. So in 2017, we said race and ethnicity. And if you look at the two graphs below, just this is, this is just really simple. The top graph is about 80, it suggests that 80% of people who are in clinical trials and clinical trials are those things that we put together to really define the therapies for all types of diseases, especially cancer. If you look at these graphs, you'll realize that 90%, almost 90% are from whites. And they exclude, for the most part, Black, Asian, Indigenous, Pacific Islanders, and multiracial. And, and people will say, well, does it really matter? And the answer is, if you believe what I said, that where we come from, our genetics, our ancestry makes a difference in how we get cancer and how we fight cancer, then you'll believe that it's incredibly important that we diversify this. And so here's just another kind of demonstrating exactly what I discussed in terms of really understanding that we're different on some levels and a lot of levels. And if you believe that diversity counts, this makes sense. Here's just another graph just demonstrating about the, 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 the representation of Latinos themselves. And we are incredibly underrepresented in a lot of cancers, including colorectal. And so at the end of the day, how do, we, how do we choose people for clinical trials? And this is incredibly important. And, 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 and this is really, really important for everybody. For the most part, back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I'm talking like five, 10 years ago when clinical trials were kind of up and coming and, and still going on, we used to exclude people based upon HIV status, hepatitis B status, hepatitis C status, sometimes uncontrolled diabetes. 
And if you think about that, right, in the year 2023, where to some clinical trials for cancer, which again, determine the therapies that we use to cure cancers or try to do our best to control cancers, we're excluding people with diseases that we can almost cure, like hepatitis C, or we can really control like HIV or diabetes and things like that. And so this graph right here just shows you just a small ounce, it's a small kind of inkling of how many patients were excluding with this disease process, and the majority of them were Black. And mind you, I'm talking about race and ethnicity, and, I, and, I, and the studies have yet to be done on identity, on gender identity, which is, becomes an important topic. And so here's just another kind of three or four things that I think that as physicians, we could control, and we don't need to be excluding people from being treated with the best or be on trials for the best. And so we revised this, right? So we said, you know what, we're going we're, we're gonna to play with the data. And we're going we're gonna to say we're going to get rid of uh, ridding people of eight with, eight, you know, you know, or ridding these, these, these criteria that exclude us from being part of these clinical trials. And we actually balanced them out. And the, the little graph to the right, which says revised criteria, we recognized that while we were excluding a good percentage of Blacks, when we got rid of those stuff that we as doctors can control and aren't scared of, we actually evened it out. And that's, again, in the Black population. And so, you know, we do better now because we identify things better. But for the most part, for the most part, imagine these are the studies that we've done on race and ethnicity. If we start throwing gender identity in this and really recognizing the data, we'll realize that there could, there, there number one, is a difference amongst us all, regardless of, 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 of what, 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 where we come from. There's a difference, it's a genetic difference. And if, 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 if I'm telling you that the subtyping of race, for instance, Latinos are just Latinos, we're not just from Mexico or Brazil, we're different. That as we start to go dig deeper and deeper and deeper into who we are as individuals, it's incredibly important that we identify ourselves when we go to the doctor's office or we talk, think about clinical trials. And the reason is because one day we're gonna recognize that the further and further we know about your gender identity, about your race, about your ethnicity, the better we're gonna be to identify certain therapeutics that are gonna help one versus the other. And so it's, it's, it's incredibly important that, that that message get conveyed. And I thank Dr. Fernandez for giving a great talk about the importance of screening. Guys, screening is great for catching things early, but the great thing about Dr. Fernandez and his group is that he'll, he'll, he, he gives hope to a lot of people that don't have hope with advanced diseases of the belly. And so we really push the envelope at VCU and, and, we're, and we're here to serve. And so I hope that the, our messages have come across and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Davino. So many notes that I took from what you said. For those of you watching as what stuck out to you the most, what was the most interesting thing? What was a revelation? And I think one of the cool things that you talked about that I took notes is um, ancestry, the inherited genes. Um, I wrote down trials and studies and how important as, as a Latino man, I participate and do my part, but also as part of the LGBTQ community, also do my part because all that information is going to be so important. I hope you guys have questions. Um, but next, uh, I'm going to introduce Kathy Flores. Kathy Flores is a cancer survivor and a member. No, no, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Trevino. We're going to come back to you with some Q&A. Uh, but Kathy Flores is a cancer survivor and a member of the Latinx and LGBT community. Uh, she works in anti-racism and um, activism programs. And although she's retiring from her job after 30 years, which bravo, she said, she said in the pre, she will not retire until she's dead. So she will continue to do her work. Kathy, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for this great, rich discussion on race and ethnicity. I, I know I'm here to talk a little bit about my story as a cancer survivor, but um, I, I haven't been 30 years in the same job, but so 30 years in this work, but I was the diversity and inclusion um, leader here in our city with the mayor's office for a number of years. So like, this is just music to my ears hearing, um, hearing us focus on those who are the furthest from justice, the furthest marginalized in um, in any kind of talk about health equity, right? So um, I'm not a colon cancer survivor, so, but my story is one that many queer cancer patients probably have experienced and it helps kind of explain some of, it helps highlight why LGBTQ folks may be reluctant to get screened. So my cancer was first detected 
after I had a pulmonary embolism after a hysterectomy. Um, at this point, I'd hardly been diagnosed with an aneurysm, multiple sclerosis. Um, so I came into this with some disability um, already. And at that time, I, you know, I didn't know anything about thyroid cancer, except that people kept telling me it was the good cancer. Let me tell you something. After two thyroid cancer surgeries, radiation, and a lifetime of meds, I'm not sure that any cancer should be called the good cancer. But nonetheless, I went through this process. Before I went in for testing, I asked my doctor if my partner could be in there with me uh, because I had a lot of fear. I'm a domestic violence survivor. And so just a, just a heads up on, I guess, a trigger warning here that I'm going to mention something about domestic violence. Um, my experience was around strangulation. And so when I went in for even to have a doctor look at my neck, even though I have been a domestic violence advocate for a lot of my years, I had a lot of fear around that. And the doctor told me that um, my partner was welcome to come in. The day of the, the test, which was just a needle biopsy um, in my neck, um, the day after the day of the test, I changed into the gown and I sat in this dentist looking chair and um, I asked the nurse to please go get my partner in the waiting room. And the nurse said, you know what? I think your friend is gonna be more comfortable staying out there. I corrected the nurse several times using the word partner. She continued to use the word um, friend. She became firmer in her denials. I started to feel panicked, stonewalled, anxious, all of the things you don't want a patient to feel, right? I was, and I still am a domestic violence advocate and I'm used to advocating for other people. But in this moment, I was like, are you kidding me? I'm gonna have to advocate for myself in this moment. Um, my heart rate increased, my breathing got quick. I started to explain about my trauma, the doctor's approval. She stayed firm and she kept calling my partner, uh, my life partner, my friend, and I kept repeating. And it felt like this power struggle. I was like, how am I in a power struggle over my relationship? Um, <clears throat> and we were in a Catholic hospital. That was the other thing. We were in a religious hospital and I knew my odds were not in my favor at that moment, but this was the only hospital that was covered under my insurance. Um, but even then with that power struggle happening, I told the nurse, I'm canceling the test. I'm getting out of here. This, this is too distressful or uh, stressful. Then the doctor came in and said, like, what is going, obviously seeing my distress, what is going on? He said, go get her partner right away. And so the nurse begrudgingly did. When my partner came in, they had no clue that this was all going on behind the scenes. They only saw how upset I was. They figured it was a trauma response. Um, but I was already in this state of distress when they, you know, went into the test and it was not in the best interest of me as a patient, you know, because of one hospital employee's bias or one person's bias in the medical field, I could have been denied the basic, you know, the base, I was being denied the basic comfort of having my partner with me, but I could have been denied so much more. Um, I realized that legal protections um, were really, really important for me. And what would have happened if I had been not conscious would they my father was an independent fundamental baptist preacher and not very fond of um me and my partner so i was thinking is the next is the next natural call or they would they call my my father so it became it became kind of a source of advocacy for me i advocated with the governor's office and we were able to pass and we became my partner and i became part of a lawsuit to help pass domestic protections at the time domestic partner protections um and this was pre-marriage equality but um, after that incident, I had so much fear with every medical thing that happened. And, you know, now we live in a time where um, marriage equality seems to be, um, it seems solid for a while, right? But marriage equality for LGBTQ people is currently under attack. So the status of my ability to have my partner with me is still under attack, even though we've gotten married and my partner has transitioned. My partner is non-binary trans person. And in the state of Wisconsin, here's another disparity. In the state of Wisconsin, you can't even change your marriage license to match your legal name. In many states, you can't if, you've become, if you're transgender and you've changed your name. So we have to trap, but luckily we got married in Illinois, did some advocacy there. They changed the laws there. But this is just one more thing. We traveled, we still travel with a, a living well, birth certificates, marriage license, because we never know when we're gonna be denied access to each other or someone's going to try that. This is just a brief window into like my experience. We had many more issues with disability and many more fears around um, being served uh, equally. 
you know, my partner also had to go through fresh hell of trying to get support. They have allowed me to tell you this, they are in recovery from alcohol. And at the time they went to their AA meeting to look for support, very upset about, you know, the cancer diagnosis. And in that meeting, somebody stood up and started giving homophobic slurs and saying things. And in, in that moment, the most vulnerable moment, we recognized, well, there was no place for me as a cancer survivor. There was no place for my partner to get support. I didn't know about the LGBT. I don't even know if the LGBTQ cancer support network existed in 2008. We'll find that out, I'm sure, after this. Um, but there weren't any support groups for us. I think some additional things that I want to, I'm here to talk a little bit about the disparities. Uh, so there's a lack of family support for LGBTQ folks. That's part of why um, we might not be getting screened early or soon enough. And once we have cancer, there's a lack of support uh, because sometimes our families of origin, um, you know, deny who we are. And I, our work with Diverse and Resilient, we work with gay, gay and bi um, black men and black trans women specifically around HIV and other STIs. Um, and we know, we know seeing firsthand that this is, this is an issue that is extremely, extremely, um, it's just a big issue in the black community, especially about getting to the doctor. At Diverse and Resilient, we created toolkits to help um, LGBTQ folks go in and know what to talk about with their doctors and not just focus on things that had to do with gender identity or the, this, the regular screenings, um, but to really focus in on some specific screenings around testicular cancer. Um, and, and sometimes we use different wording actually in the LGBTQ community because for trans folks, they may not identify with some of the wording that is used. So I'm, I'm here just to say, I'm grateful that there's both in the Latinx and the um, LGBTQ uh, perspective that there's advocates out here because I think because of a lifetime of disparities that we receive, there's a lack of support group, there's a lack of education. We need to be doing more advocacy. We need to be changing protocols. We need to be training doctors. It's, I'm so grateful to be here with uh, physicians who are so, um, so educated on this because I can tell you in my time, it would have saved a lot of heartache and probably I would have might, I might've even had a better outcome in my healing. Um, I had a rough healing um, experience with my cancer and it's, I, I think it's loaded because of the stress that I went under. Um, and that is my time. So I just wanna, I just wanted to put it out there that I'm just so grateful to be here and um, hope that we can work together on the disparities to make sure that people don't experience what my partner and I experienced. So much for sharing all that, Kathy. That I, I know from the watching the chat and my own personal story, there's so many that I'm like, yes, I'm over here in my head going, I only because I can't, I can't get too excited on the screen, but I'm like, that's exactly what me and my partner went through. I'll, I'll tell you this quick story because when we were going to treatment, there was a nurse at one of the hospitals that I needed some just some Advil, something for pain while I was in my room. And the moment she found out we were partners, not business partners her attitude completely changed. And but little did she know that I was Daniel G. Garza. And I was like, nope, we're about to raise some hell up in this hospital. But you're right. Um, I want to say that a lot of folks were not aware of the LGBTQ cancer network. I wasn't aware of it when I was diagnosed in 2015, but I'm so happy that I'm part of it. And I'm glad that you know about it now too, because we can share the information. Um, for everybody watching, I hope that you picked up on what Kathy was talking about something stuck out to you, please let us know in the chat what stuck out. I'm reading the chat and there's a lot of connection to your story. Um, the, the note that I was gonna read earlier says, racial ethnic populations and the LGBTQ plus community are more likely to have lower rates of colorectal cancer screening due to the barriers that we've been talking about and they pay, uh, that they face when accessing healthcare services. And as you can see, it's not just so much the lack of information or what we don't know about our demographic, our race, our ethnicity, um, how we identify. It's also the other people on the other side that we go to access services. If we don't feel comfortable, if we don't feel safe, if we don't, if if we don't know that they know our terminologies to use, then that will take us away. And that's again, we talk about um, our the genes that we inherit from our families, but it's also our what is it, uh, nurture and nature working together to keep us from reaching those. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now because we have some questions on the board. I wanna share. So we're gonna bring on uh, Kathy, uh, Dr. Trevino, Dr. Fernandez. And I do believe I saw some questions on the board. So let me bring those up because there was a general question for everybody. Uh, here it is. Um, they asked, they say, I'd like to ask the panelists, including Marcela. So Marcela, you're part of this too. During the Q&A part, um, 
They want to hear more about what contributes to some of these screening barriers in communities, and especially for folks who are both, both Hispanic, Latinx, and LGBTQ+. And although we've already mentioned some, is there anything you'd like to add to the list that we haven't mentioned yet? Whoever wants to begin. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly start. I think there are so many, like what Kathy shared with us is, is just a small example of something we all have seen. And if you haven't seen it, it's because you weren't paying attention. Um, and again, thank you for sharing. And and, uh, and and it can go from the bottom of the socioeconomic status on people who are struggling to buy food and put food on the table. They don't have money or time to skip job or work or insurance to pay for a screening. Um, to other things uh, more complex or more societal, like being afraid of being treated differently or actually making taking that extra step and give it a try regardless and then showing up and actually being treated differently or or mistreated. Um, there, there's so much that, uh, but but there's a common theme and, and I think uh, we can see this with, with all minorities. And, and of course, uh, money is a big thing. Fairness is, is a part of it. Um, and, and being fair to everybody, I think will, you know, as a principle, will address most of it. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to add too, oh, okay. um, I think one of the disparities is the LGBTQ community, you know, we, we have a self-sufficiency is something that we are used to being because we're not, we're so used to not being included at the table. And sometimes that sense of self-sufficiency can prevent us from seeking help when we need help. And so it's getting over that barrier. The, and I, I wanna just add one little thing here and it's, I'm, I'm not gonna get political, but I'm gonna say LGBTQ rights right now are under attack more than they've ever been in this country, trans rights. Doctors are being under attack for providing trans inclusive care. That will add to higher death rates of cancer that will higher the higher death rates of across the board. So for us, legislation matters. It matters that we are not just treated equally in the office, but that the laws around us protect us. So it, it's helpful to have doctors speak out about that. It's helpful to have patients speak out about that. But that is one of our biggest threats right now um, as, as patients is the threat around us um, with legal, with legislation that's happening. And you're all in states, I don't know where you all are, but every state right now has got some sort of anti-LGBTQ or anti-transgender bill um, before before their sessions. Um, so just pay attention to what's being passed because it, it will create further harm. Dr. Trevino? So I think the one thing that I, I want to say to, to this group, and I think that hopefully resonates throughout, is that this is not new to us, right? And so as Latinos, Blacks, underrepresented minorities, it, it, it's the, it's especially in this country, we've kind of passed the buck a little bit when it comes to discrimination and, and bring, brought down. And so now we have a community which is coming up from the shadows for the most in the past 20, you know, 20 years, LGBTQ community has started to come out. And I think that that it just like for blacks and, and, and Latinos, et cetera, I think the, the word pride and empowerment have to come into play here. And when I go see a doctor, I I tell him and and I I, I tell him all the time, I'm a Latino. And I'm actually to some degree now, because I think we're going to dive deeper and deeper, I'm Mexican. And, you know, they asked me what my gender identity is, which is good. And I think it's important that we, if they don't, if you don't get asked, you need to say. And I think while now a lot of people might not understand it, the future, and I see this happening, there is going to be a lot of psychological, there's going to be biological, there's going to be so many different things that are going to be different amongst us. And if you truly believe that we are all individuals and God made us in a very special way, who, where we come from and who we are including to the point of gender identity is going to make that difference without question. And so I'm telling you, when I hear everybody talk and kind of maneuver through this, I become so excited about thinking about how do I write that next paper about, about the LGBTQ community and what they're going through. And the fact that there are barriers that aren't even like physical barriers for them to get the care. And a lot of them are psychological. I mean, who doesn't want to get healthcare because they don't want to be seen with their partner, and even though they might be a loving relationship, 
and they're, they're embarrassed. Like they don't want people to look at them in a certain way and, and love is love, but you, you don't want your doctor who you respect or the nurse that hopefully will, will treat you right to treat you a different way. And so Kathy's story really resonates with me. And I think that that is just horrible. And we need to assure that that goes away and goes away quick. But, you know, I, I think we should be proud of who we are. We should be empowered of who we are. And when we come to those offices, we come to those offices saying, we want to be taken care of the same way you would take care of anybody else. And if you don't, that's a problem that we need thank to address. So thank you. With that. Marcella? Okay, I just want to mention something quick because I see one of our partners also has a question. The only thing I wanted to mention is that I, I'm so happy to see Dr. Trevino and Dr. Fernandez to represent a community that is very scarce. And I'm talking about access to providers who speak your language, and in this case, Spanish, because we have, that's one of the barriers for cancer screening. People do not cannot communicate properly with the doctor. So when you see doctors like Dr. Fernando, Dr. Trevino, it's like, great, I'm sure their patients love the fact that they can speak to them in Spanish if they need to. So that's one thing, that's the only thing that I wanted to mention because everybody mentions the other reasons as well. Thank you so much. Um... I will get to Esther in just one second because I just have one last question that we had on the board before we go. And this is just, um, what is Dr. Fernandez, Dr. Trevino and Kathy, one thing that people can put on their list that they should mention, talk to, to their doctors when they walk in for any kind of screening so they can better advocate for themselves. Dr. Fernandez? Well, let's say what's one thing that people should ask you, Dr. Fernandez, that maybe they forget to ask sometimes. Um, I, I don't know if I understand the question, but um, I, I think the main thing to ask is to be treated like anybody else. And, and that's, I, and, I, and I'm not saying anything different. I'm just saying it in a different way. I think, you know, like fighting for rights of this group or, or us and who's, in the worst part, I think we all should be treated like a human being. And I think the thing to ask is, please treat me like a human being. And 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 um, that's actually something I don't think you should need to ask, honestly. As a physician, it kind of breaks my heart to, you know, hear anybody say that they had to advocate for themselves to be treated uh, humanely. I think we could have a whole nother hour yeah. of tragic stories when going yes. to talk. And, and in my case, I don't, I don't know. I, I treat with such complex things that this such different case by case that I don't think I can come up with just one thing to ask. I try to tell everybody everything they need to know or what they're going to be thinking on the ride home. And well, that's why you are awesome, Dr. Fernandez. That's why you're <laughs> awesome. Dr. Trevino, is there something that we yeah, should be asking? I think they should always ask, what are my risk factors for developing certain cancers? Because remember what I said to you earlier, Every one of us is different. And if we smoke, it presents a certain risk. Certain behaviors, unfortunately, present a certain risk. You know, and I think that, that, that you know, the bisexual, lesbian community, the male community, all, it doesn't matter whether you're gay or not, you all have a certain risk factor for certain diseases. And, and sometimes, like we said, we forget that, that we, even though, let's say, a female who, who isn't at a high risk for having HPV, which is one of the leading causes of cervical cancer in this country. And she feels she doesn't need that cervical screen. That's, that's nonsense. You need to have a cervical screen. And so always ask, what are the risk factors for me developing certain cancers? I think that's incredibly important. I would add quickly to that, just quickly to that. Um, I'm often mistaken when people ask me why I'm not like about birth control. If I'm sexually active and I say I'm not on birth control, that tends to trigger something. And I think people need to really understand, doctors need to understand relationships and ask why maybe somebody isn't on birth control or things like that, because it's an assumption that I'm at risk for pregnancy if I'm not on birth control and, and things like that is just making these assumptions. And I put some things in the chat, but yeah. Cool. So for those of you, before we go to Esther's question, number one, um, make sure that you can be completely open with your doctor and that you can trust them with your information. Number two, be honest with your doctor. If you don't have that honesty level where you can talk about extra factors like smoking or other other things that can affect you, then rethink that relationship. And number three, do not leave anything to assumptions on the other side. Do not let them assume 
who you are and what you stand for. So there you go. Three things that you can take with you for advocating for better cancer. Esther, what is amazing. your question? Uh, amazing question, Daniel. I'm sorry to jump in. We are now at time. So Esther, could yes. you please put your question in the chat and then we will respond in our follow-up materials. We're so appreciative to everyone for, for, for joining us for this hour. It's been a phenomenal hour and just really want to shout out and thank Dr. Trevino, Dr. Fernandez, um, Kathy, and also Daniel for that amazing facilitation. Also want to thank all of our staff at the National LGBT Cancer Network, um, Noel Larkin, um, Hafsa, and myself, Bryce. We really, really, really appreciate it. And we could not have done this without the phenomenal and amazing Marcella. So thank you so much, Marcella. Um, we have loved working with you and it's been such a joy. We're going to send out any follow-up materials afterwards. So please stay tuned to your emails. Thank you all so, so much for joining us.